You can take a seat, Shubhra. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so yes, good job. I came ten minutes early. Yes. <laughs> you know, uh, you this is to... takes time. The fight is fifteen. No, but, uh, yeah, this have faced everywhere. So yeah, if you have yeah. to zoom, drop Take. us to it. But Take. this is, I think, the best solution. Sure, absolutely. If I run it and then share screen. Right. Now there are some people, Nikrishnan, the TPs, and oh yeah, joined in through Zoom. Yeah, yeah. 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 Alok will come. Alok Ray. Alok Ray. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. In fact. He made me listen to it. That's it. Great. Yeah. Great. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Take a seat. Let's start. Hello. So I say hi to Nikrishna. Which side did I look? Yeah. Hi, Uni. Hello. Hello. I am in Pune. Hi. Yes. I can see you are online. Yes. Hi, TV. You are in Bombay. I'll be now. Me too in Pune. Pune. What's so great about Pune? Retirement. Retirement. I see. I see. Yes. <laughs> I'll catch you there sometime. Yeah. That's yeah. It. I look forward to meeting you. Yes. Actually, I was in Pune last May. Okay. Because my friend went from there uh, to Ashoka University. Ashoka University. Okay. Okay. And there's a problem with doing an official test. <laughs> Okay, uh, I'll just wait for two minutes, Shubir, and then we'll start. <laughs> yeah, I'll just. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, it's okay. Okay, so I'll actually give a start. Um, so, uh, it's nice to be back uh, uh, for another Wednesday's uh, colloquium, and I am happy that we have um, another physical visitor um, who had waited for his chance uh, for almost a year now because COVID had reduced the travel uh, part uh, considerably for all international visitors. So um, I welcome Professor Subir Sarkar um, from University of Oxford. Uh, but before um, uh, Subir gets formally introduced uh, by our colleague, um, uh, Professor Mohammad Ramiz, I would like to sort of uh, give a little bit of a background to the colloquium series because um, although you know, but there are many people from YouTube who would uh, be, uh, has been an age-old tradition uh, for TIFR as it was growing because it was conceived by uh, our founding director, Professor Homi Bhaba. And it has been a, his vision that at least for one day, we get all the natural science faculty members to you know get together and listen to one of the eminent experts visiting TIFR on that day. So uh, it has been uh, sort of a um, legacy for um, the faculty members involved the students, the staff, and of course, uh, also a uh, few of the um, uh, retired faculty members who come back and stop by and um, uh, and attend the colloquium. Um, so uh, uh, without any further ado, um, I'll let Ramiz introduce uh, Professor Subir Sarkar um, formally. Ramiz. 
Good evening, everyone. Thanks for being here. Uh, it's a great pleasure to have one of our own. Professor Subir Sarkar did his PhD here, uh, I think, between 1979 and 84. And then at, at TIFR, he was working in experimental physics. Then he moved uh, to Trieste, where he was a fellow. Then uh, he was a fellow at CERN uh, and the Rutherford Appleton Laboratory. And then he started in a faculty position at Oxford, where he rose to become uh, the head of uh, particle theory group uh, at the Rudolf Peel Center for Theoretical Physics. He is, um, uh, he's, even though he's a theoretical physicist, he has a wide array of experiments he works with. Uh, and I met him through the Ice Cube Neutrino Observatory where I did my PhD. And then I had the pleasure of being mentored by him uh, as a postdoc later on where when he was a Niels Bohr professor. He has won a long list of awards, including the IUPAP uh, TIFR Homi Baba medal, I think in 2017, uh, if I'm not mistaken. And so he's the most empirically grounded physicist I know. So <laughs> that. <laughs> and so let's, let's, without prolonging this further, get on. Yeah, the Thank you. Thank you. Thank you a lot. I have to say, it's a, obviously a great uh, pleasure and honor to speak in this forum. But uh, I. When uh, uh, students were invited to present their thesis results, uh, maybe as a, 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 a occasional opportunity, I think it's it's well. I certainly appreciated the opportunity then, and it's uh, you know obviously uh, rather uh, uh, well moving to be back in the same room in the same place and seeing that this tradition has been kept up as you say for all these years. It also reminds me that I'm 42 years older than that day, <laughs> but you know, what the hell. So today I do have something interesting I hope to say to you, and that's about cosmology. So what you see here on the screen is a simulation of our current understanding of cosmology embodied in what's called the standard cosmological model. Uh, of course, the standard model of particle physics, as you know, is actually misnamed. It should be really the standard theory. And the difference is something that I believe Manfred Eigen uh, once said, that a difference between a theory and a model is that a theory can only be right or wrong. A model as a third alternative, it may be irrelevant. Okay? <laughs> and in that sense, uh, we do have the correct name for the cosmological model. Uh, it is a very successful model, as you'll see, but uh, whether or not it is the true description of the universe remains, I believe, to be established. So this simulation shows you the familiar, uh, what's called the cosmic web of galaxies, clusters, superclusters. This is meant to be a Hubble volume, as large as the visible universe that we can see today. And this has been simulated on a giant supercomputer in actually a whole cluster led by a group at Stanford. It's called the dark sky simulation. And um, whereas this picture is extremely inhomogeneous and anisotropic, statistically, it's a Gaussian random field. It is actually statistically isotropic and homogeneous because that's an underlying assumption of the model that uh, the uh, structure grows in a fluid which is initially isotropic and homogeneous. Now, the question I'll address in this talk will be a very simple one. Uh, is that actually borne out by the observations that have come since this model was first developed, starting, in fact, again, 100 years ago, uh, Friedman's seminal paper was 1922. And my philosophy in doing this is something that I picked up from my mentor, Danny Sharma, uh, who I met at Oxford, who turned me on to cosmology. And um, he is, of course, you may know him as the uh, supervisor of many famous people. Uh, he influenced Penrose, Hawking, and many others. And his statement in this book that he wrote uh, back in 78 was, uh, essentially, we are tempted in cosmology, which is, after all, you know, if you like, the oldest intellectual activity of humankind, 
every culture in history has had its cosmology. We ask the big why questions, you know, why are we here? What's the meaning of it all? Where are we going? But before we do all that, as empirical physicists, we should first ask, what is the universe actually like? And that is the question that I'll address here. So uh, this is going to be a semi-technical talk, but for those of you who are, I know this is a very broad audience, you're working in other areas. If you want a more accessible account of what I'm going to talk about, uh, there is an online journal called Inference, edited by Shelley Glashow and many other uh, very distinguished editors who invited me to write an article for it. I didn't choose the title, that is from Conrad, of course, but I did choose this uh, uh, quotation here from Lev Landau, which is that cosmologists are often in error and never in doubt. And uh, although I was unable to trace the origin of that quotation, uh, Rudolf Piles, whose center I'm at in Oxford, did know Landau, and uh, Rudolf, uh, Rudy Piles, a student, told me that he had often heard him say that he had actually heard Landau say this, so maybe it's true. Now, the point that uh, distinguishes cosmology from most other physical sciences is that uh, there are limits to what we can learn about the universe, because everything we learn comes from either on or within the life cone uh, of our past. We cannot move somewhere else in the universe and check if the universe looks the same from over there as it does from here. So we have to have a philosophical principle to relate our vision or our knowledge of the universe to the true universe. And that assumption goes by the name of the cosmological principle, uh, which was actually implicit in the work of Friedman and Lemaitre and Einstein uh, about a hundred years ago, who founded cosmology, but it was actually dignified as a principle by uh, this man, Edward Mill, who was actually the professor of mathematics at Oxford. And he said something which seems very sensible and very uh, obvious. Uh, the universe must appear to be the same to all observers, wherever they are. In other words, an extension, if you will, of the Copernican principle that there's nothing privileged about us. And this then enables you to construct a cosmological model on the basis of what you observe from your particular vantage point on the basis that it, that vantage point cannot be special. So Mill did this at Oxford. At Cambridge, of course, they had to go one better. So they uh, said this principle is restricted form because it's only talking about the independence of spatial position, but you still have a dependence on time. You, you know, uh, and Bondi and Gold then propose the perfect cosmological principle that you have independence of both space and time. Uh, and that, of course, is philosophically even, you know, puts you in a more, even more exalted position. And that was the steady state theory of the expanding universe, uh, which uh, actually I've heard as a student discussed in this very room many a time. Uh, and uh, some of the early work uh, on testing the steady state versus the Big Bang hypothesis was actually done at our own radio astronomy laboratory in Uti. Vijay Kapai presented his results here on the angular diameter di distance relationship gleaned from observing occultation of uh, uh, radio sources by the moon for which the Uti telescope was ideally designed, not by accident. That's why it was made what it was, right? But as you know, those arguments uh, were always subject to uh, uncertainties about evolution, which is the bugbear of cosmology, are things always the same or do they evolve intrinsically such that you cannot actually use them uh, to test physical ideas. And therefore, uh, this model, this controversy continued for quite some time until the discovery of the cosmic microwave background uh, by Penzias and Wilson, as you know, uh, and that essentially sealed the fate and it tell, told us that uh, we have had a hot, dense past. We are at a special point in time. The steady state theory was killed by this. To be fair to it, it wasn't killed until 1991 when the Kobe satellite measured its spectrum to be extremely close, as close as you can ever hope for to a black body. This is one of the few times when something that you write down as a mathematical function uh, or a piece of paper is reflected in the sky. And this spectrum is so good that that put paid to any hope of generating that microwave background by rescattering of starlight 
which is in fact got the same energy density as Hoyle and others had uh, argued for. So the, uh, the perfect cosmological principle uh, was dead, but the spatial one lived on. Why did it do that? Well, the answer can be found in Steven Weinberg's textbook, from which I certainly learned gravitation and cosmology. And he says the real reason for the adherence to the cosmological principle is not that it is correct, but that it allows us to make use of the limited data provided by observational astronomy, right? A statement which is actually, even now, still pretty true. But he did assert that if the data will not fit into this framework, we shall be able to conclude that either the cosmological principle or the principle of equivalence underlying general relativity is wrong. Nothing could be more interesting. So I like to quote Steve Weinberg because nobody messes with Steve Weinberg, okay? He said it, and I'm sure we all agree with this sentiment. You start out simple with the simplest model you can have when you have no data. But when you have the data, then it is your responsibility to go back and check if those underlying assumptions of your model are indeed valid. Now, just to highlight this, uh, let me uh, point out to you that the standard cosmological model is essentially based on this principle, because that's what tells you that you can construct a maximally symmetric metric for space time, the Friedman, uh, the uh, Robertson Walker metric, which have the metric is this quantity G mu nu. It's a tensor rate two indices. And I've written it in a suggestive form, looks like a Minkowski metric. So uh, if I write instead of time, I use something called conformal time, which is this d eta, which is simply the usual time divided by a squared, where a is the scale factor in this uh, metric. The scale factor basically allows you to stretch the metric. So conformally, it is equivalent to the Friedman metric, uh, to, sorry, to the uh, 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 metric of special relativity, uh, but it, it, it's not uh, 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 Minkowski metric even at infinity. This is important. Now, with this metric, you have an enormous simplification because Einstein's equations essentially consist of taking the metric consisting uh, of here, there are so g mu nu, mu and nu run from one to four, and you therefore have 16 possibilities for how you construct a equation uh, from the Riemann tensor, which is obtained from the metric and the scalar curvature, which you see here. And you can relate that geometry on the left-hand side, which is constructed from this, to the energy momentum tensor, which is on the right-hand side, via Newton's constant. This is what general relativity is. It tells, you know, matter tells space how to curve, and uh, the curvature uh, it tells matter how to move. Now, this is uh, all fine as long as this team you knew is simply ordinary matter, non relativistic particles, dust, as they called it. Uh, of course, if you go back to the early universe, uh, radiation becomes more dominant. But even radiation has a simple equation of state. The pressure is just one third of the energy density. However, in the 1930s, uh, people like Pauli and Zeldovich and others realized that if you go up to high enough temperatures, you melt matter down into the fields of which the particles are the excitations. And quantum fields have zero point energy. And that enters here uh, in terms of the zero point fluctuations, which then contribute a term to the so-called cosmological constant, which you have here on the left-hand side of the equation, multiplied by the metric, reflecting the underlying general coordinate invariance of general relativity. It's a fundamental symmetry based on which Einstein had his great uh, intuitive vision of how to connect curvature and uh, uh, geometry. And this adds then to the bare cosmological term, if you will, to create the capital lambda, which is what then enters into the Friedman equation, the friedman lemaitre equation, which tells you how the scale factor that I had there responds uh, to the evolution of the matter and energy content of the universe. And what you see here is the first term is rho matter. The second term is the curvature of spatial sections. And the third term is the cosmological constant. And I can write this in a simple form by dividing, uh, defining this omega matter, omega curvature, omega lambda as so, uh, which are simply the fractional energy densities of all these three components in terms of the so-called 
critical density that you see here. And if I then uh, divide this thing throughout by H naught squared, which will feature very prominently in our talk, the present day rate of expansion, which is around 70 kilometers per second per megaparsec, then you get a simple sum rule. And this is all that there is to the standard model of cosmology. The basic underpinning uh, theory says that the sum rule is what that uh, all that there is. And actually, you have to supplement it by a second equation for the acceleration. This is a simplification of the Rajodhiri equation. And what that tells you is that the uh, rate of change of the velocity is proportional to the energy density plus pressure. Why that is that? Because pressure is just kinetic energy, and kinetic energy also gravitates. Everything gravitates in general relativity. And that means that if you have lambda, which has got a negative, pressure is the negative of energy density, then this term can actually become negative, so that the overall thing can become positive, and A double dot can be positive. The expansion rate can accelerate. So when you start confronting this model with data, the first thing that was recognized is that the expansion rate apparently is accelerating. I'll come back to this in more detail later. So this provides a handle on this term, omega matter minus omega lambda, that is constrained by the Hubble diagram of supernovae. How bright are supernovae, which are believed to be standard candles as a function of the redshift? You also get a measure of this curvature term from observing the fluctuations in the microwave background, uh, which you see here. The typical angular size of these spots is one degree. And if you do a multipole expansion, one degree corresponds to a multipole of around 200. So you see most of the activity in the power spectrum is at 200. And that angular scale actually corresponds to the horizon on the last scattering surface of the microwave background, the sort of uh, sound horizons really, but that's almost the same as the light horizon. And that provides a measure of the curvature, which you see is close to zero. And finally, from various measurements of clusters of galaxies and baryon acoustic oscillations. So these same oscillations in the microwave background are echoed in the matter pass, the spectrum of fluctuations in the density of galaxies. And this is the two-point correlation function of galaxies. The Fourier of that is the power spectrum. And that also, if you look carefully, shows little wiggles, which are like little brothers of these big wiggles here. And that uh, also gives you a handle uh, on this cosmological parameter. And putting all these things together, we can then plot this famous uh, uh, omega lambda versus omega matter plot, which I'm sure you have seen many times before, where you have a diagonal constraint from the supernovae, another diagonal constraint from the microwave background, uh, this one here, and then you have a vertical constraint from the uncertain measurement of matter, but they all coincide, uh, intersect each other at this point which then tells you that uh, uh, omega lambda is uh, basically from the sum rule about 0.7. And that then corresponds, if you look at the definition of omega lambda here, that corresponds to lambda being 2 H naught square. So the bottom line of this long diatribe is that if we assume isotropy and homogeneity in the cosmological principle, you are then led to the inexorable conclusion that there is a cosmological constant and its value a fundamental quantity, its value is actually set by the Hubble parameter today, which is neither a constant nor anything fundamental as far as I know. What is its value? Well, the physics units, H0 is about 10 to the minus 42 GeV, not a scale that is well known to our high energy physics friends, right? It is an infrared scale. It's the size of the universe. It's the inverse of 10 to the 28 centimeters. And therefore, this is the actual scale of lambda, the Hubble parameter, 10 to the minus 42. But we choose to interpret this lambda as due to this vacuum energy that you see here. And therefore, we write it out in Planck units. We divide H0 squared by 8 pi Gn, which for a particle physicist is the inverse of the Planck mass square. Planck mass is 10 to the 19 GeV. So what we get is a scale for the vacuum energy which is the geometric mean of the Hubble parameter and the Planck scale. So it's about 10 to the minus 12 GeV, which is the same as the microwave background temperature today, not a coincidence. All the energy densities today of matter, CMB, everything, you know, to within factors of 10 are about the same. It's an interesting fact. So this 
standard cosmological model uh, is as depicted by the, uh, you know, this was, I think, came out of the NASA drawing uh, room. Uh, if you see that uh, we apparently uh, have had a slowing expansion after the Big Bang. Uh, of course, nobody knows what actually caused the initial explosion of space time, but we are apparently now entered the era at a redshift around one where you are accelerating again. And by making measurements of the uh, microwave background and uh, galaxy clustering and uh, the other observations that I talked about, baron acoustic oscillations, astronomers say they're doing so called precision cosmology. And they say that uh, we now know exactly what fractions of dark matter, dark energy, et cetera, we are made of. Baryonic matter that we are made of is only 5%. There's about five and a half times as much dark matter. But most of the stuff is this lambda, which is more generically called dark energy uh, on the, give, you know, taking into account the possibility that it might in fact evolve with time. So this is a very simple model. This is often said to be have, you know, only six or seven parameters, very simple. Of course, that depends on where you are coming from. Lambda is just a number in that way that I wrote it. But if you ask where, what the region of lambda is and how you can get a value of order 10 to the minus 42 GeV, then uh, for a field theorist, it is not one number. It's the uh, bone in our throat, as Weinberg famously called it. Nobody has an explanation for why it should have that value, why it should even be zero for a start or close to zero, and thirdly, why it should have a strange value of order H naught. And what I want to say is that there have been a large number of uh, very impressive experiments, telescopes, satellites, et cetera, uh, starting with uh, this the W map, which is the successor to Kobe. Uh, then you have the Sloan Digital Sky Survey from this telescope in Mexico. Then there was the Planck satellite. I showed you a result from it. Uh, then you have uh, the forthcoming Euclid satellite, which will hopefully fly uh, next year on the SpaceX rocket. So let's hope that works. And uh, this is the dark energy survey, uh, sorry, dark energy spectroscopic instrument at uh, Mount Hopkins on the Mayal telescope. And uh, this is the Rubin telescope under construction in uh, Chile, uh, which will carry out the so-called uh, large scale survey of space and time. Now, all these uh, objects are measuring the parameters of the standard cosmological model with increasing precision. This is called precision cosmology. Now, I will be uh, provocative and say I'm not interested in precision cosmology. I'm interested in accurate cosmology. And you might ask, what's the difference? Okay, we often use these words interchangeably. So my colleague, Nathan Sacrist, I think put it best. He said, Think of the, remember the Hubble telescope, the mirror of the Hubble telescope. It was precisely ground to the wrong shape. And then they had to send up a team to put a corrector plate and get it back working, right? That's the difference between precision and accuracy. So let us see what I mean by that. First of all, what can our uh, high energy physicist colleagues tell us? Well, they say quite right, rightly that they have a complete understanding of forces and particles in the laboratory. And uh, we that's the standard model, which I've written here in symbolic form. So that there is a Lagrangian. That's the epitome of what you can do as a theorist. You can have a Lagrangian. Here are the gauge fields. You are familiar with electromagnetism. Now we must add the uh, gauge carriers of the weak interactions and the gluons, which carry the strong interaction. And then you have these terms, which involve fermions, the size, and this phi, the fundamental scalar, the Higgs field. And these terms, until recently, were not particularly well known. Now we know everything about them. Well, we know that there is a Higgs boson. We know that there is a potential, which I've written it here in the canonical form, but you don't know this potential precisely. Measuring these terms precisely is the goal of the next 25, 20, 25 years at the LHC. However, what was recognized by theorists is that this is an effective model. This is a description of physics up to some scale, call it n. And I can always write down an infinite number of additional terms, so-called non normalizable operators, which carry, uh, uh, which break the symmetries of the standard model, which break lepton number and baryon number, uh, which have flavor changing currents and so on. And that gives you new phenomena like neutrino mass, which you have evidence for, 
proton decay, which we don't yet have evidence for. But today I want to focus on two terms which are not much talked about, which are the terms which are of dimension less than four. They are super renormalizable. And one of them is the notorious divergence in mass of the Higgs boson. The Higgs is meant to be a fundamental particle. It sees everything in the vacuum and it therefore gets a correction to its own mass through that coupling. For example, it couples to the top quark, which is heavier than the Higgs. And that itself gives it a mass correction, which unfortunately diverges quadratically. It diverges as the square of the cutoff. Unlike, for example, the electron, which does not have a divergent mass because it is protected by the fact that it is a fermion. If the electron mass goes to zero, then it's uh, the way it's spinning is well defined. You can't race ahead of it and see it spinning the other way. And therefore, it has a chiral symmetry that cannot, uh, that is not broken. And that, according to Tooft, is a natural understanding of why the electron mass can be small compared to the Planck scale. All the corrections will come as the log of the cutoff, whereas here we have a quadratic cutoff. That's the difference. But if you could only invent a partner of the Higgs, which was a fermion, then the problem would be solved because that would have its mass protected by chiral symmetry. And that's the whole setup called supersymmetry on which many of uh, many people, including people here, have spent time on. And I'm not going to talk about that. I'm going to talk about the other term at the super renormalizable level, which is the vacuum energy. Now, this term is particularly embarrassing because in principle, you can't even calculate it. Okay, the whole process of uh, renormalization and regularization of the model means that you can always add counter terms to cancel it out. It only becomes relevant when you add gravity to this. Now, this model does not have gravity. You couple gravity to it as a classical theory, Einstein's theory, and that interface is rather blurred. And therefore, we can attempt to address this problem by supersymmetry, by making the Higgs composite, so it does not have that quadratic divergence, but we do not know how to address this term here. And the point is that the scale of this term, although we can't strictly speaking calculate it, we can guess that its value must be of order at least a TeV to the power fourth, because that's the scale of the standard model. That's the natural value for it. And that 60 orders of magnitude bigger than the number I gave you in the last transparency, which we deduce for the vacuum energy supposedly driving the uh, expanding rate of the universe. Now, Pauli worked out long, long ago that this means that this vacuum energy cannot couple to gravity. Why not? Because Einstein has told us that all forms of energy density couple to gravity. But he just wrote in the handbook der Physik, which I was interested to see, he had just asserted as is obvious from experience, the zero point energy does not produce any gravitational field. Unfortunately, it didn't write down in the margin why that was so. Okay. So that puzzle is with us to this day. There have, of course, been many uh, attempts at solving this, but I think it's fair to say that there is still no uh, total consensus in the community on what could be the solution of this. There are, uh, I want to flag up a recent idea just to get my string theory friends here going, that uh, Diwali has argued that in DC space, which is this uh, exponentially expanding space dominated by uh, lambda, uh, there is no future infinity. So you can't actually define uh, S matrix, the foundation of uh, anything, any process in fundamental uh, physics, uh, such that uh, you might argue that lambda might be forbidden in any S matrix formulation of quantum gravity because you cannot then preserve unitarity. So you don't agree with this? Yeah. Okay, so I knew I would get you going. Okay, <laughs> all right. All right. All right, let's. So they're not the real world because That's right. So let's talk about the real world. In the real world, we are told that omega lambda is of order omega matter. Now, why is that? Because after all, this guy is decreasing as the cube of the scale factor, and this one is constant. So as you change, uh, go back in time, the two should differ by orders of magnitude. Why are they of the same order today? What have we done to deserve this? Well, one thing you can do is to try to make this uh, some dynamical field, some the, the vacuum energy of a field, give it a nice name, call it quintessence, 
you have to make that field a very special field. It's uh, if you think of, of the usual Mexican hat potential, the height of the hat has to be 10 to the minus 12 GeV. That's what you're trying to explain. But the curvature has to be 30 orders of magnitude smaller of the same order as the Hubble parameter. Otherwise, this field will roll to its minimum immediately or not roll there at all. You want it to evolve just as to be slowed down by the expansion. So you get an attractive solution. So you can see that this tuning of 30 orders of magnitude, that's the same tuning as the bare cosmological constant. This does not really afford any deeper insight. Thousands of papers have been written on such constructions, uh, but they are they are uh, somewhat arbitrary. Same comment applies to models where you uh, 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 note the fact that gravity is much weaker than the other forces. And you wonder if that is because Perhaps gravity sees more dimensions than we do, the other forces do. Very interesting idea. But then at what scale would there be a difference uh, between gravity and the other forces? The only natural scale in the problem is the Planck scale, which is some tiny, tiny scale. But for this to be relevant to cosmology, you have to make it a cosmological scale. So you have to again put in the present Hubble radius, 1 over h naught, as the scale where gravity is being modified in order to make this relevant to cosmology. So whatever you do, you have to put in this H0 by hand. You, I might construct after much difficulty a theory of massive gravity, which is ghost free. But if for the graviton to have any relevance to cosmology, it must have a mass of order the Hubble parameter, 10 to the minus 42 GeV. So you know, from a purely empirical uh, uh, viewpoint, it does not seem to me that this is really getting any closer to the real thing. If you are putting in by hand that same fine tuning parameter that is disturbing you about the cosmological constant problem in the first place. Uh, there have been quantum gravity people who actually have argued that maybe there is lambda is always of order the expansion rate squared because H inverse is in some sense the size of the universe. So you know, it's some kind of a Casimir effect. But that cannot be right, because if I just write it like that, if this is proportional to h squared, I can just pull it on the left hand side. And that just is a renormalization of Newton's constant. So that doesn't make sense. So I say that there is no physical explanation for this coincidence problem. And that makes me wonder whether we infer lambda to be of order h naught squared, because that's just the observational sensitivity. That scale is the only dimensionful scale in the standard cosmological model because of the assumption of isotropy and homogeneity, only that scale enters into the problem. And therefore, it enters into every cosmological measurement through the so-called distance ladder. And therefore, are we inferring this only unknown in the model to be the only dimensionful parameter that can possibly set its scale? Now, that is just a, uh, you know, a, some, a thought in order to establish you to work harder. Now, one thing that the standard cosmological model gets very right, or rather is very successful at, is that it gives us this one slide, you know, nice cartoon picture of how the that cosmic web of galaxies that we saw in the simulation uh, is actually achieved in the real world, starting with tiny fluctuations that you see imprinted on the cosmic microwave background at the point of last scattering, when the photosphere of the early universe became transparent about a few hundred thousand years after the Big Bang. And then just saying that they grow under gravity uh, can allow you to explain this fantastically complicated universe today. If you allow me about uh, five times as much dark matter as there is baryonic matter in, so that these fluctuations could have started growing actually before last scattering happened. Otherwise, there is not enough time. Right? So in fact, this I would say is the strongest evidence for uh, matter that does not have interactions with photons you need it to support the growth of structure. And therefore, uh, we have a clear picture of how we create structure in the universe starting with these fluctuations. We also know, going back to Harrison and uh, Zeldovich, that these fluctuations have to have a scale-free spectrum. Uh, otherwise, you cannot explain the universe as you see it today. And actually, as it happens, a scale-free spectrum is suggestive of time uh, uh, invariance in time which is also a characteristic of dc the space. So you can see that it is then very tempting to think of some kind of a quasi dc phase of expansion when you are also dominated by a scalar field. And uh, that's what you call inflation because that naturally generates uh, quantum fluctuations with a scale invariant spectrum. 
which are then stretched out to uh, cosmological scales and provide you just what you need to create the structure. So the whole thing fits together. This is, in that respect, a very attractive idea because you can then address it with observations. So uh, our universe, when mapped out to the largest scales we have from this is from the slow digital sky survey, does actually look very much like the simulations that I uh, showed you that you make in that paradigm of inflation with a roughly scale invariant spectrum growing in dark matter uh, through just uh, uh, gravity, a linear perturbation theory. Okay, it's all tangible, it's all very accessible, uh, and, and it does give you a reasonable match to data. Now, locally, so this scale is 600 megaparsecs. So just for uh, those of you who are not familiar with these units, uh, our nearest galaxy uh, Andromeda is about 0.8 of a megaparsec. We call it a megaparsec. So we are talking about something 600 times further, a thousand times further. But locally, out to about 200 megaparsecs, it has been mapped very carefully by Brent Talley and collaborators. And this is what it looks like. We are at the center of the picture, part of the Virgo cluster of galaxies. And we are falling towards Virgo. Uh, Andromeda and uh, our galaxy are falling towards each other. We are all falling towards Virgo. But that is falling towards Shapley, the supercluster that you see here. At It says 15,000 kilometers per second. So uh, you can work out from that that it's at about 200 megaparsecs. right? And it is extremely inhomogeneous and extremely anisotropic. So we might ask the questions. Surely on this scale, we really have to argue very hard to say that this is a homogeneous domain. To assume that you are a typical observer, surely it matters if you are in a high density region or in a void. Surely it matters what direction you look in. Supposing I look along this gap between this structure or I look along the filament, Light travels according to the local gravitational field everywhere. Gravi General relativity is a local theory. And therefore, you really need to worry about along your past light cone, what are the fluctuations that would have affected the null geodesics that you now observe from your vantage point today. Next, you ask on bigger scales, what do you know about the isotropy of the universe? And in fact, that picture that I showed you of the microwave background was not the true picture that you would see if you pointed a detector at the sky. What you would see would be this, a huge dipole anisotropy, which is about 100 times stronger than those fluctuations that uh, we uh, ascribe to for use for structure formation. And this was actually predicted by Dennis Sharma back in 1967. Uh, that's, so I heard about this from him. He had predicted it because he knew already in 67 that because of the structure around us, we have peculiar velocities, which are velocities which are superimposed on top of the Hubble expansion in the model. Now, from a purely generativistic viewpoint, you can't actually separate the two just like that. But for the sake of analogy, let's think like that, that we have a local velocity, which in the standard model is supposed to wash out as we go to larger and larger scales and average over larger and larger domains, then we approach this idealized Friedman, Robert Lemel, Robertson Walker universe, and locally we'll have deviations from it. But if you have deviations from it, that means we are not in the frame of reference in which the microwave background is isotropic, and therefore there should be a dipole anisotropy, which he predicted. It was observed just a two years late, a year later, in fact, 68. And uh, here is the first calculation of that anisotropy, by Peebles and Wilkinson, who said, you know, this is special relativity. You are an inertial observer moving at the velocity v, uh, which is beta here. And therefore, the temperature that you see in different direction should vary according to this formula. So today, it's a nice exercise to set when you're teaching undergraduate general relativity to compute this. Now, this was, in fact, detected, as I said, and detected, uh, measured very well in subsequent uh, uh, experiments. This is from George Smoot's uh, Nobel lecture, and he points out that actually the motion is rather complicated. The Earth is, of course, moving around the Sun, but the Sun itself is moving around the galaxy, and it's actually moving in the opposite direction to that hotspot. So these two velocities add up, and our net motion is not a thousandth of the speed of light, because this is a milli-k, and that is a temperature in anisotropy of one part in a thousand. 
It is actually uh, twice that because, in fact, uh, we are uh, moving around the uh, galaxy in the opposite direction. And uh, the entire local group, which is ours and Andromeda and other satellite galaxies, satellite clouds and so on, we are all moving in some direction which they believed was because something is attracting us from there, some local inhomogeneity. And of course, with our uh, very artistic imagination, we call it the great attractor right now. So the great attractor has been sought for for many years. Uh, I can give you the bottom line, the great attractor has not yet been found. Okay. And according to the theoretical model, the great attractor should have been there on a scale of 100 megaparsecs or so, because uh, the universe is meant to be uh, average, uh, uh, average on scales bigger than that, the universe is meant to be homogeneous. Nevertheless, we correct all the data that we measured at Earth by transforming to this microwave background frame because that's the frame in which the ideal uh, you know, uh, universe is realized. So the first thing we can ask is, as we average out to larger and larger scales, does this local flow decrease in amplitude as you would expect from the theory? The theory is this purple line here. This is, uh, in fact, uh, from linear perturbation theory, but uh, numerical simulations uh, can also be done of this the ensemble average will give you this. These are the one sigma and two sigma variances on top of that, which are rather large, because as I said, this whole thing is a Gaussian random field. There are large fluctuations, anything can happen. But you see the measurements of this bulk flow are consistently higher than the expectations from the standard cosmological model. Now, we have not been able to do this very well with uh, error bars are large, because to do this, you can't depend on the redshift as a measure of the distance. You have to measure the distance independently because remember, this is not the Hubble expansion. These are peculiar velocities, right? So you have to measure the distance by some other means and that is the bugbear in cosmology, knowing distances accurately. So some of these are so-called um, fundamental plane distances, which is some empirical correlation for elliptical galaxies between their brightness and their size on the sky or uh, the tully fisher relation, which is an empirical relation between the speed with which spiral galaxies are rotating and their brightness, right? But very recently, in fact, last night, a new data point appeared on this, uh, uh, which is uh, due to actually Tully's group, the Cosmic Flows 4 survey. And they have gone out further than anybody has so far. This was, by the way, some old work that we did uh, using type 1A supernovae, but they have gone out to now uh, 250 over little h megaparsec. So around 300 megaparsecs, and they see a flow of 414 plus minus 36 kilometers per second out there, right? Which is uh, for the first time pretty uh, definitely not inconsistent, you know, not consistent with the standard expectation. Now, as I mentioned earlier, anything can happen in a in a random field, and so you could say that maybe we have just happened to be lucky or unlucky enough to be in some part of that universe where the flows are statistically unlikely, but you know that's why they're large. How statistically unlikely is that? Well, when we did this exercise, we worked out that we had to be less than 1% likely. We did this by interrogating that dark sky simulation. But now this thing is so unlikely, it's unlikely at the level of 0.003%. Yes? Yeah, so for the new one, what, how do you calibrate the data? I mean, to get such a, I mean, measurement, uh, does it provide any details about how they calibrate Yes, yeah, so most of the uh, measurement, most of the distances uh, up to here are, as I said, Tully Fisher and Fundamental Plane. To go out there, you use Type 1A supernovae. True, but it is the same measurements that are the basis for uh, the claim that the expansion is accelerating. So, so let us be consistent about calling them, uh, you know, reliable standard candles. But you're right; that does depend on using using them as standardizable candles, which I'll come to later. Yeah, but thanks for raising that. Yeah. Yes. For decreasing it well for, well uh, 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 let me say this uh, the culture of showing one sigma error bars came from perhaps from particle physics 
But of course, as we all know, we uh, don't show the systematics. We don't even know what the distribution is. And in cosmology in particular, it is very hard to always identify every systematic that there is. It's hard enough in the laboratory, right? So uh, it's often the choice of the particular group, whether they, you know, some people might show a large error bar. It's not that they've made a worse measurement. They're maybe just being a little more upfront about the uncertainties. So uh, don't take this literally, is all I'm trying to say. This has been calculated. This one and two sigma on the theory, that's a rigorous calculation. But the uncertainties on the measurements, you still have to look a little deeper. OK, so now I come to uh, some way to, you know, so what is the bottom line there? Yeah, it's interesting, it's intriguing, but it's not compelling. You know, like all kinds of mess, some important points were made just there. How can we get clear of all this and have a definitive test to check if that cosmological principle assumption is correct? This was actually start suggested by George Ellis, a radiologist from South Africa, and John Baldwin, who was, in fact, uh, the head of the radio astronomy laboratory at uh, Cambridge, Cavendish Lab, uh, who seemed to have met at the Orthodox Academy of Crete, where I actually went for a string theory meeting once, very enjoyable. And what they said uh, is that uh, if the standard interpretation of the dipole anisotropy as due to our peculiar velocity in a homogeneous isotope universe is correct, then radio source number counts must show a similar anisotropy because they are also at cosmological distances. And in conclusion, they said if the standards of rest determined by the microwave background and the number counts were to be in serious disagreement, one would have to abandon. Either the idea that the radio sources are cosmologically distant, or the interpretation of the microwave background as relic radiation, or the standard Friedman Robertson Walker universe model. So, right, it was all spelled out right there. Now, today we would not entertain either A or B, right? So, we believe that the only option left is C. At that time, when they wrote this paper, the, the measurement uncertainty on this uh, uh, peculiar velocity determined from the uh, uh, anisotropy of radio source number counts was very uncertain. What we have done is to improve that number. Now, this is a plot of radio sources on the sky from a good textbook. And that textbook says that this illustrates the tropic around us. Right? So I wondered for a long time what this thing was. That's actually the Milky Way. And the holes are the bits of the sky that you cannot see from uh, Green Bank, West Virginia, where the telescope that did this is located. But the point is that there are only about 35,000 sources on this sky. And with 35,000 sources, you cannot see the effect that uh, we are going to take a closer look at. That effect is called aberration. And that is an effect is... Uh, which has been known for several hundred years. It was actually first measured by Bradley, who was the civilian chair of astronomy at Oxford. And he was actually trying to measure parallax, which we are more familiar with, but he found it like 10 times bigger and at orthogonal to it, which told him that a star uh, is not where it looks like uh, on the sky because we are moving, so you'll see it displaced from where it is. And he worked out that this was because of the finite speed of light. And he wrote down this formula, which is, in fact, uh, uh, a relativistic formula. Two hundred for Einstein. Okay. Second. Uh, there is a Zoom audience issue. Yeah. Abhijit, could you switch off your uh, audio? Yes, yes, done. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Now, uh, you have already seen the effect of aberration in the dipole anisotropy in the microwave background. But radio sources don't have black body spectra, they have power loss spectra. And then you have to take account that if you are a Doppler boosted observer, you are observing a different part of the spectrum according to how fast you are moving. So if you have a, a you can describe the distribution of sources by a power law and the spectra of individual sources also by a power law, then these two indices will enter into that formula for the dipole you expect which is again, as you uh, saw earlier, d over c cos theta, but now there is a term 2 plus x times 1 plus alpha multiplying it. So this makes the whole thing about 0.5% for us, uh, and therefore, uh, obviously, detectable. What we look for, we look for, we take a flux-limited catalog. In other words, every source over a certain flux. 
And now, if you look in the direction of motion, supposing you have the isotropic source catalog and we are moving in the direction of this red dot, then some of the sources in that direction, which were below my threshold, will be boosted above it and vice versa in the backward direction. So I will see a dipole. Of course, I have amplified the effect here so that you can see it. The real effect is a bit smaller. The real effect, as I said, is 0.5%. And to see it, we need a lot of sources because there is always a random dipole which will be going as the poison noise. So you need to beat that down. So you need about a million objects to beat that down sufficiently. We also want these objects to be at redshift more than one. That's why you need the radio sources, because if there is a source accidentally close to us, it will give us a dipole from just its proximity. We don't want that. We are after the kinematic dipole, which is independent of the distance, but depends on the velocity, source spectrum, and source flux distribution. So we did this first with radio sources. And I should just pause to say that this was done with my collaborators, Jacques Collin and Roya Mohai who are at the Institute for Astronomy and Astrophysics in Paris. Uh, and Mohamed Ramiz, who is here now, he was in Copenhagen at that time, and myself. And then we did uh, an exercise with, uh, uh, with uh, infrared sources mapped by a satellite, which was a large number. Uh, but the problem was that their redshift was not very large. So there was a possibility of a significant clustering component that you see here. Whereas with the radio sources, we don't really know the redshifts directly. We just estimate them to be large. But now we have addressed both concerns. And we have a catalog of quasars, which is large, which is at high redshift, and which therefore has no clustering component. And for this exercise, we are joined by Sebastian von Hausegger, who is a postdoc at uh, Oxford now, and uh, Nathan Seacrest, who is at the US Naval Observatory in Washington. So very quickly, I'm running out of time. For the radio sources, you, you constructed a full sky catalog. To see a dipole, you really need the full sky. By marrying the uh, NVSS catalog, which was done from the VLA, the very large array at uh, Socorro, New Mexico, with a similar survey done from Molonglo in Australia. And we have to scale the fluxes to match them. Just to say very quickly, we have to remove the galactic plane, just like in Peebles' uh, picture. We, we don't want that thing there which can give a spurious dipole. We cross-correlated with the catalog of radio uh, infrared sources from the two MRS survey in order to remove those. And then we see that cos theta that uh, you saw in the equation, and it fits what you expect. The direction is in accordance with what you expect, but the amplitude is too large. And this had been noticed already by Ashok Singhal, uh, uh, radio astronomer now at PRL, and uh, But he had even less sources and only the NVSS catalog, not the full sky. But most importantly, the statistical significance of this, as Rami is established by doing extensive Monte Carlo simulations, is only 2.8 sigma. You can get a fluctuation at 2.8 sigma that looks just like a massive dipole on the sky. So it could just be a fluke. So let me jump ahead to this catwise catalog. Now we have a, a sky which is much more densely populated. Every blue dot is a quasar. These are mid-infrared quasars, which means what you are looking at for radio sources and quasars, it's always the same central engine and supermassive black hole. But in one case, you are looking at the jets of plasma that have been shot out from the center, created synchrotron radiation lobes. Whereas here, we are looking at the accretion disk surrounding the central engine, which has been heated up by the radiation from the uh, emit coming out from the black hole and heated up to temperatures where they emit in microns. So these are all uh, micron bands, 3.4, 4.6, etc. The important thing is that we were able to measure the redshift for a subset of these using data from the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. And as you can see here, the median redshift is over one. And in fact, 99% of them are far enough at redshift more than 0.1, that's 500 megaparsecs, they're far enough that we have no concern about a local clustering dipole. We also know the distribution of the spectral indices and the distribution of the fluxes. And when we smooth this map, we see a dipole, which you can measure with, with what we believe is a robust estimator. So now we can ask, is this consistent with the test that uh, uh, was proposed by uh, uh, Alison uh, Baldwin? The answer is this. We see a dipole. The direction of it is this triangle here. It's consistent with the star that is the microwave background within the uncertainty. 
but the amplitude of it is not. We ran 10 million simulations of the null hypothesis, which is the standard cosmological model. The uh, CMB dipole is due to our motion. And that would say that we should see a dipole in the quasars, which is here with this spread. What we see is out here, and only five of those 10 million simulations actually accidentally gave us an amplitude this big. So very transparently, the p-value is five times 10 to the minus seven. If you want to want that in sigmas for a one-sided distribution Gaussian, that's 4.9 sigma. And we believe in open science. We have made all our data and code available publicly. So anybody can look at that catalog and check our results. And two groups have already done so and confirmed them. In fact, we have gone a bit further. We have gone back to that NGSS catalog and done a lot of massaging of it. Uh, for those of you who do radio astronomy, you will see that we have used the mask from the 408 megahertz uh, Haslam survey to blot out any possible galactic contamination and uh, reduce the number a bit, but this is a better quality map. And for wise, you have increased the number by lowering the flux threshold without any loss of uh, completeness. And putting it all together, we find that these two dipoles are actually consistent with each other. In other words, there is no frequency dependence of the dipole, which would have hinted at a non-gravitational source. Uh, and we know what, what, what the value is and where they're pointing it. It's interestingly, the agreement between the two improves if we first subtract out the CMB dipole, assuming it to be kinematic. That's very intriguing. That suggests that the CMB dipole might actually be truly kinematic. What we are seeing here is some additional effect. Now uh, we are more ambitious in calculating the p-value, more generous, if you will, because we don't even require that the dipole point in the direction of the CMB. It can point anywhere it likes. We can generate the contours of one, two, three sigma uh, in, in this plane of the dipole amplitude versus the angle. And both cases, we are uh, outside where we expect to be, which is in the centers of these. But now if we combine them, uh, because they're two independent samples, they have no sources in common, then we are exceeding five sigma, which at least in particle physics is like the golden threshold for taking some result uh, uh, seriously enough. How has this result been received? Well, Jim Peebles, who I mentioned earlier, has, uh, you know, was very obviously very intrigued by this. He was awarded his Nobel Prize in 2019 for establishing the standard model of cosmology. And he says that our uh, dipole anisotropy, that this anomaly is as well established as the Hubble tension, yet the literature on this is much smaller than the hundreds of papers with the phrase Hubble tension in the abstract. I expect the difference is an inevitable consequence of the way we behave. I have no idea what he means by that. Okay. Now, if I might have just 10 more minutes. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm already over time. Five minutes. Let me come back to Subhanavi, which was asked about earlier. So as you, you know, I'm sure you've all heard talks about this, so I'll go through it rather quickly. So there is a class of supernovae which are believed to be thermonuclear explosions as opposed to core collapse, which give neutrinos and so on. We don't really know what creates them. It could be binary system. It could be a compact object accreting from a massive companion, whatever it is. Their light curves are basically, they become as light as the entire, uh, you know, you can see them in the daytime. Uh, in fact, there was one scene in uh, 1572. There was one scene in 1604, these were uh, Tycho and Kepler. 1066, there was one, I think. And these light curves, as you see, rise to the top. This is the log scale, and then they fade away. This tail that you see here is the lifetime of nickel 56. Uh, uh, that is what is powering the late light curve. But this part is a very complicated radiation transport inside a giant hydrogen bomb. It cannot be simulated. What you can do is to measure them, and the real advance is that you know how the light curve rises because once a supernova becomes visible, you can go back and look at how bright it was two weeks earlier because your CCD camera mapped that part of the sky two weeks earlier. Right? This is the big advance. And therefore, we can see that the supernovae are not standard candles. There, there's a scatter of a odd factor of 10 in the light curves. But it turned out that by looking at a of using an empirical correlation between the peak magnitude and the width of the light curve, as is plotted here, you see a clear correlation, which was discovered by Phillips. And using that correlation, we can stretch all these curves to lie on the same template 
that you see here. The correction is different in different colors. So there is also a color correction, right? This is entirely empirical, but this allows you to use them as standard candles. And to date, there are of order a thousand supernovae. Uh, this is a from the joint uh, light curve analysis catalog released in 2014. The first time supernova data was actually made public. And this is the distribution in redshift, about a dozen at high redshift from the Hubble Space Telescope. Uh, about half the number is very local. And in between, there is the SNLS survey, Supernova Legacy Survey, the green ones, and then the Sloan Digital Sky Survey uh, at this intermediate redshift in blue. Now, this covered only the strip of the sky. The green ones were just four little directions in the sky. Okay. And the local ones are, of course, all over the place, as are the few Hubble Space Telescope ones. In other words, we haven't actually done a comprehensive study of the sky. The numbers are too small. But what you uh, publicly release is that peak magnitude, the star indicates the peak, and you uh, release these corrections that you do in this supernova adaptive light curve template, which makes it a standard candle. Notice that the red shifts here have already been transformed to the microwave background frame, which we have just argued is perhaps open to question. Okay. Now, why do all this? Because then you can do cosmology with them. You can measure the magnitude. You measure the redshift, and when you plot one versus the other, you can extract these cosmological parameters. That's how you got the number that I showed you uh, right at the start of the talk. For example, this number there. But you don't really need to go to a model. You can do cosmography. You can expand the luminosity distance in a Taylor series. The first term is the rate of change. The second term is the rate of rate of change. We call it the deceleration parameter, Q0. The third term is called the jerk for some reason. This is fine for the catalog that we have to date. It only goes up to redshift of one or so. So you can do the Taylor expansion. Now, uh, uh, I'm racing through this, but I'm happy to come back to this later the questions. We are not very happy with the way that the supernova people do statistical analysis because they essentially do construct a chi-square, which looks normal, except that they add a term in the denominator here, which they adjust until they get a good fit to the data chi-square of one per degree of freedom. So in other words, they're artificially enlarging the error bars to allow for unknown unknowns until they get a good fit to their chosen model. That data can obviously then not be used to look at any other model. And I think most of you who do data analysis will agree that this is not what you would call principled. We, in fact, we constructed a, a maximum likelihood estimator, uh, which is the same as a Bayesian hierarchical model for people like Suvadi who like Bayesian statistics. It's exactly the same likelihood. If you do all this, uh, then we discover that the red shifts that these people have used, as I told you, every measurement that we make from the Earth is corrected for our motion with respect to this ideal frame in which the universe looks isotropic. And Ramiz did some detective work and discovered that the corrections that they have made, which are basically a special relativistic correction, which are shown here as these colored points as a function of the redshift, they apparently stop when you get to a distance of about 200 megaparsecs. After that, there is no correction. So in other words, these supernova uh, collaborations have assumed that we achieve, we focus to the CMB frame in 200 megaparsecs. But I've shown you data that that is not actually happening. So what we did was to undo the data to ask, undo the corrections to ask what does the data actually look like as measured. And when we do that, we find something very interesting. If we allow this luminosity distance expansion as a function of redshift, which as I said, involves the Hubble parameter, the deceleration parameter. If we allow this deceleration parameter to have a monopole component and a dipole component, then our maximum likelihood estimator tells us that what is observed in the sky is actually a dipole, as indicated by this red and blue patch, aligned with the direction of motion through the towards the CMB. And the dipole amplitude is about 50 times bigger than the monopole amplitude. Notice that this scale is expanded respect to this. So in other words, the evidence for lambda, which is that monopole term, is only significant at 1.4 sigma. Whereas the dipole term, which tells you that the, there is acceleration, apparent acceleration, but it is not the same in every direction on the sky, that is actually significant at 3.9 sigma. We are rejecting the standard model at very high, well, at 3.9 sigma significance. 
And very quickly, I'll mention that this is something that we already had in mind because Christos Sagas, the relativist, had argued that if we are in a bulk flow, such as the one that I showed you the data for, marked by this yellow patch, then a, we would be so-called tilted observers. And the energy momentum of that bulk flow, when input into the Dijoudhury equation, will tell you that, in fact, you will, might infer a different value for the deceleration parameter from the same observations than a observer who is not tilted, as in this case would be. And that means that there is a second term in the equation which can reverse the sign of the uh, deceleration to make it look like acceleration. And a clear test of this idea is that we should see the acceleration only in the direction of our motion. And that's just what we see. So let me come to my summary. The standard model that we have uh, uh, taken on board and uh, you know, which we talk about in the same breath as the standard model of particle physics was actually established much, much earlier. It was established before there was any data. A hundred years ago, we didn't even know that we lived in a galaxy but at the time when this was formulated. So now that we have the data, I think you will all agree that we should test its foundational assumptions. In the case of the standard model of particle physics, this was done. It was tested at the quantum level at the lab collider at CERN. The radiative corrections are measured. We know that the gauge group is what it is. We know that the particle content is what it is. They're no longer assumptions. In this case, the assumption of isotropy and homogeneity is still an assumption. And we find that it fails the test that was proposed by Ellis and Baldwin. So this is a challenge to the assumption of the Fedman, uh, uh, Lemaitre, Robertson, Walker metric. In particular, it means that the standard procedure used, uh, for example, in supernova cosmology of boosting everything to the CMB frame and making these corrections for the so-called peculiar velocities of the host galaxies, this is all unjustified. If you actually look at the data, there is significant evidence of anisotropy uh, in the acceleration, which suggests that it is not due to vacuum energy. Lambda has to be isotropic, but due to the, an artifact because of our being peculiar observers, non-Copernican observers. And uh, therefore, uh, there may be really no evidence for lambda. I hasten to add, this is not a solution of the cosmological constant problem. I don't have a clue as to why it should be zero, but there is no evidence for it, lambda to be of order H naught square. That's all I'm saying. So where do you go from here? There is a manifesto that was given by Ellis uh, from around the same time, which is called the fitting problem in cosmology. How do we construct a theoretical model from observations made in an imperfect universe uh, to a theoretical model? And that prescription can be followed if you had data. We are going to have the data soon from these major new observatories that I mentioned, and the, there's already a lot of data. There is much more coming soon. And I urge all cosmologists, especially uh, those who are perhaps at the beginning and rather than the end of their career, to look at this critically and not believe everything that we have told you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Subir. Uh, thank you for this wonderful uh, presentation. Um, so questions, yes. Yeah, so I have actually two comments and a question. So first comment, actually, as a card carrying cosmologist, I should object to some of the statements you made. Such as? Uh, in particular, in one slide, you said that we are spending billions of dollars to measure cosmological parameters very precisely, but yes. the attempt is made to under test the fundamental assumptions. I think the two things are exact opposite. Billions of dollars are being spent to actually exactly to test the fundamental assumptions. No self-respecting cosmologist is just interested in measuring, you know, omega lambda to seven decimal places just for its sake. I'm glad to hear that. So I think the reason the billions of dollars are being tested because you know you want to have many different ways of measuring cosmological parameters in different ways. And if they don't agree, when you improve your procedure, you get tensions. And that tells you that you know something is wrong with your cosmological model. That's one way to go. And yeah. that is what everyone on cosmologists are actually interested in. So we are actually testing the fundamental assumptions. Then you go on to your next comment. And yeah, uh, second comment uh, uh, was about uh, this. Uh, you are equating in the even in the last slide. You are equating the standard cosmological model with FLRW metric. So I think that is a misrepresentation of what cosmological model is. Metric plus perturbations. 
right? I did say that in my talk, yes. Yeah, but uh, so when you include that, then actually uh, you are not really, uh, even if your result is correct, you're not really uh, disproving standard cosmological model because all the facts that you are seeing, they are small perturbations. The we are seeing the facts you are seeing out 10 to the minus three perturbations over the background. Well, I did so a good assumption. Sorry, I did highlight uh, the yeah. slide. Uh, so, you know, the standard uh, uh, Baldwin. But dividing into the background plus perturbations is still valid. And FLW uh, yeah, I mean, is the authority of Ellison Baldwin, who yeah. clearly stated that this is the case. But do continue. Well, FLW is still a good assumption for the background. That is your view. What okay. you are doing is that is my view. Yeah. But now uh, let me come to the question. Yes. Uh, so you said that you did, uh, uh, you know, the 10,000 or 100,000 simulations for this anisotropy thing. So these simulations are these Poisson simulations where you simulate a homogeneous universe with Poisson. No, no. That is, okay, sorry. Maybe I didn't explain yeah, that. So well. the, simulations are, uh, the simulation is simply called, uh, consists of generating mock skies with the catalog that we have got with like the respective distributed according to cluster according to lambda cdm or the person homogeneous distribution they are simulated according to the cosmological uh, principle which says that they should be isotropic so, on the sky isotropic homogeneous distributions yeah. and then we boost it right. according to the standard uh, uh, interpretation of the cmb dipole right. so this that is the sky we should see so i am very happy that the dipole you measure is disapproved because uh, if I, I will be much more worried, lambda CDM would be vulnerable. Uh, I think you should disapprove lambda CDM hmm. if your measurement agrees with the what you measure from this Poisson sky because lambda CDM is not Poisson, and you never have to uh, reach yeah. homogeneity. I, I think uh, uh, because I do have a hidden slide which I would like to show, right. which uh, answers that question. But I think the significance will change significantly. I think no, it doesn't. Like you know, CDM simulations instead of person. Uh, uh, please give me a minute. I'll show you a plot, not from us, but from um, another so group. We have this, done this, uh, cal yeah. So we have done this calculation ourselves. I can. Uh, refer you to my paper. So, okay. approaches person. Can you uh, can you look at this slide, please? This is a plot of the same data, catwise catalog. This is the angular power spectrum, and this is the expectation from lambda CDM on small scales. This is a, a power spectrum, so this is in multipole. Sorry, this is not very big. Let me try and make it bigger. Okay, that's better. So this is the familiar thing, CL and L, which you know from uh, uh, CMB. This is the lambda CDM expectation, and it is actually a good fit to the data up to about a L of about, uh, what is it, 30, okay? L of 30 is about one third of a degree, right? On scales bigger than that, you can see this point, this is the dipole, it is up here. It is highly discrepant from what you expect in lambda CDM which is this purple line here. So these guys actually found exactly the same thing that we had done. And they, in fact, show that on very small scales, actually, there is a better fit to the nonlinear power spectrum in lambda. Well, lambda is irrelevant here. It's CDM. This is structure formation in CDM. It actually, you get a pretty good fit in the catwise catalog to what you expect for structure formation on small scales. But when you go to large scales, large angular scales, you see the same anisotropy that we saw. And in fact, they say in the paper uh, that the power at large scales remains anomalous and unexplained. So I think that state, last statement you made, I'm sorry, I cannot accept that. Okay, but still, I think the significance will change significantly if you compare with lambda CDM versus Poisson. I'm saying the significance you have empirically shown that it is not the case. Okay, okay I think um, I'll just invite, yes, I'll invite Ramiz, um, but I can see the, the TIFR is alive. Um, yeah, so uh, Rishi's comment is about something that Subir mentioned called the clustering dipole, which is that in the perturbed FLRW yeah. universe, you do expect sources to be clustered, some yeah. over densities to exist. Yeah. For a given redshift distribution, you can calculate how much this is. We have done this. It's in the appendix of our paper and it's less than 1% of the excess base. So your statement that if this was accounted for, the significance would change significantly is not true. Other groups that have analyzed our data come to the same conclusion. For example, the, the re recent Bayesian analysis, which says that this effect from lambda CDM 
is uh, is uh, you know it's it's too small to uh, to explain this and it is uh, 78 times smaller to be precise yeah. that's what you said and uh, the data and the code everything is public this paper has gotten some attention now so if you really think this it can be falsified by this uh, this consideration yeah. i'd be more than ha we, happy we, if you yeah. went ahead and did it yeah. uh, look, first, I first, I, can I say this? first rishi read our paper then we'll discuss yeah. it uh, no i i have so if you read the paper you were commenting on it yeah so I, I have a, progress. Yeah, you know, I have a final personal comment. So yeah. this was this. Subir mentioned the cosmological per principle as this assumption that you make in the absence of any data. And today you talk to cosmologists. Oh, look, the dipoles there. How can the universe be an isotropy? I like, oh yeah, that's just because we are moving with respect to the frame and this cosmic rest frame in which the universe is isotropic. And similarly, this clustering dipole is just the idea that oh, there are more sources actually in that direction. But to me, that also means the cosmological principle is wrong. No. Yeah, but uh, this is just don't, don't get into the debate. His point was clustering can explain our signal. I made a categorical statement that the clustering estimate theoretically is 78 times smaller, and the data also shows, as they in fact highlight in their paper, excess dipole and high clustering signal above angular scale 18 degrees remain anomalous. So please read these papers and then we can discuss further. Thank you. Hi, uh, yeah. Thanks for the nice and provocative talk. <laughs> so I have a couple of questions. I certainly succeeded, yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but a couple of questions, many a bit on technical side, sorry for the general audience. So one of the question is, so when you are, did this estimate from the QSR data. Yes. So usually when it, what we do, we measure from aberration and from modulation, the dipole term. That's correct, yeah. So did you independently check whether the inferred velocity is same from both aberration and modulation. The reason behind this is, as you know, that uh, shape of the luminosity sig signal yes. for a radio of source is not well known. That is new to the right. alpha. Yeah. I just want to know that what drives the measurement at the both in the similar. Pattern. So th that's a good question. So the thing that matters is what is the shape. So this powerless, you can see here, the dipole is actually arising from sources which are below this flux threshold, going above the flux threshold. Right. In the forward. Right. So only the slope at that point matters, yeah. this flux distribution. So even if this integral flux distribution has a more complicated form elsewhere, we are only interested in the power law fit in the neighborhood because only a tiny fraction of the number of sources you're looking at, 0.5%, are being boosted above it in order to give us the dipole. That but there see. can be a fluctuation by integral. Correct. So elsewhere. then what do you do? So when we do this simulation of the mock skies, since you are familiar with the uh, simulation business. Sorry, this is not altering. What we do is we take that distribution of the flux indices and the power indices, and we sample them with our Monte Carlo 10 million times. That's, that is the 10 million simulation, picking them at random. So any correlations between them are preserved in that sampling as well, right? So therefore, even if the spectrum is, uh, well, it's not concave, it's usually convex downwards. In the neighborhood of the flux threshold, we reproduce exactly what the actual data is, the population is. So our mock skies therefore contain all the information as the real sky from which the catalog was constructed. And then we ask in the mock skies, can we find a dipole by accident as mm -hmm. large as the one we see? And the answer to that question is yes, five times in 10 million, which is 4.9 sigma. That's the statement. Okay, so you're okay. saying that uh, you have checked that part. We have checked have all that, that part. part. Yeah. Okay. I mean, we have been at this for several years, so we would not do something no, no, like naive as uh, Rishi was accusing us of not realizing that there could be structure in lambda CDM. No, I, I think, think you're so well aware that's of that's this. a valid point. Yeah, I mean, yeah. we need to test that. I agree with the sentiment which is asking. Yeah. But of course, this needs thorough check here, checking. But I have a aside. Well, if you are going to challenge the standard cosmological model, you better be thorough. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah. So one more comment which I have is. About the peculiar velocity distributions yes. you are showing. Yes. So when you are, so if you go as a function of redshift, yes. Uh, the kind of sources which which you calibrate yes. are really challenging. Absolutely. So, so I, 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 would, I would be very concerned before. I mean, the problem is, as you know, because I have worked on sure, using yeah. this kind of things from cosmi microwave background. Yeah. Their systematics are, uh, I would say, easier to deal with. Yes. 
but uh, so in my opinion i would say that i will take a much fresher look towards the calibration of the, each of these measurements yes and how those distances are actually calibrated yes. because you know like supernovas yes. in low redshift have a strong metallicity dependence that's right also there's a dependence on the kind of uh, specific star formation that it has sure so it has been shown by i mean yeah, yeah. So, well, so whenever okay. people look for this trend that's and right. that was corrected for in that catalog we took it from from union 2 okay however when you look at the, this is an analysis I did myself, so I can talk about this. But as you see, when we actually estimated the uncertainties due to precisely those effects we talk about, the rather large. So we could not make any strong claim on the basis of that. Okay, for interest of time, I'll yeah. Uh, yeah, we will but, have uh, a discussion uh, yeah, at we're, snack time. We're well aware of that issue. So that reflects in the large error bars. This last data point is not mine, but that's due to Brent Tully, who is the kind of master in the field. That's the number he quotes. I cannot answer. Yes, sir. No, but they have got they have got the supernova calibration guy on board their team. Yeah. Thanks a lot, Subir. Uh, look forward to. I think one thing is clear: we are going to have a lively time during Absolutely. your stay. So yeah. welcome. Bring it on. Is what I say. <laughs> no, no. I'm not an expert, as you uh, know, yeah. and of course there are many experts in the audience. Mm. But just in terms of understanding your basic results, yes. if I can ask you. Two questions. One is, if there's a deviation, this was asked, but let me ask it in layman term. Mm. If there's a deviation from the assumptions of homogeneity in isotropy, mm. your analysis indicates it at what level? Is it one part in 10 to the three? Is it one part in 10 to the one? You know, what fractional deviation are you yeah, seeing? I understand. And secondly, if you don't mind, yes. uh, I didn't follow all the details about all the systematics. But in your view, what are the most likely sources of error, given that we all understand this is cosmology? Sure. Just as a, sure, sure. Yeah. So the answer to the first question is that we are looking for a anisotropy of 0.5% and you see a 1%. So the deviation is about 0.5%, 5 in 10 to the 3. Okay, That's the degree of anisotropy or degree of mismatch between the matter distribution and the microwave background. Right. The answer to the second question, uh, which was, uh, sorry, uh, remind me again. What do you think are the main sources of error? Is it okay. Can't right. Or is it just okay. The main sources of error that when you look at a catalog of, uh, so this works both for radiation and for sources. When we look at the cosmic microwave background, we actually look through the galaxy, which has got synchrotron emission, dust emission, etc. Those guys who look at it have figured out a way that there is a narrow band of frequencies between about 40 gigahertz and 220 gigahertz where the CMB dominates over these things. The fluctuations are, however, as you saw here, 1,000 to 10 to the 5 times smaller. And uh, studying them, uh, therefore, to the necessary precision, the claim precision today is of order 1 micro K. The overall variance in the CMB is of order 80 micro K square. Okay. Now, uh, they have achieved this uh, by employing these sophisticated cleaning methods which model the galaxy and use very sophisticated techniques in try to clean it off. For source catalogs, the scanning pattern of the satellite is important. Right? This satellite operated for eight years. This, they don't always operate at the same efficiency. The probability that it will pick out a source with a given flux, that changes with time. You have to continue to calibrate it. The calibration is different according to whether you had a cryogenic system as this one did initially or the cryogenics has switched off. Now, of course, these are well known to people in the field and they worry about this. And we are fortunate to have in our team this guy, Nathan Seacrest, I mentioned, who uh, is expert in all this. And he spent a year worrying about whether this you know, catalog was fit for purpose. And it turns out that there are actually, when you look at it closely, there are trends that you can see with the scanning pattern, with the direction from the ecliptic latitude, etc., we identify them, we correct for them, and then we find a catalog is usable for cosmological work. Right? Those systematics that you looked at are actually can be significant. They can be a few percent of what you looked at. None of them were big enough to be of serious concern. Right? That's one. But this is simply a counting exercise on the sky. This is the simplest thing you can do. A more sophisticated thing you could do would be to measure the fluxes and look for the effects that, uh, you know, Shubhadi was trying to allude to, which you can do in the CMB. Right? 
but we are we cannot do that because we don't actually have a catalog where you can measure the fluxes that well right only the numbers above a threshold so it's an integral measurement rather than a differential measurement if you think about it like that right but uh, yes uh, we obviously have to be cautious uh, before we claim a, a, a departure from the standard expectation but you know uh, this result was published in astrophysical journal letters after due scrutiny and obviously the referees had these concerns and many more as you can imagine uh, however we believe we are able to satisfy them and now, uh, as I said, two other groups uh, have also uh, at least checked that we had, didn't make any numerical error. They can, what we really need is new catalogs of objects. And that is then now coming with LSST. So soon, very soon, within LSST, we'll start taking uh, first light in another six, eight months. And maybe in two years' time, we'll have enough objects to uh, either check or reject this idea. So uh, I don't have to live very long is what I'm saying okay. to know this. Okay. Um, I'll just, I, I'll just, uh, I'm, I'm happy. Yes, I'll get back. I'm happy that we have this session right now with so much of discussion, but we have to cut short at some point. And I request both the people who are asking the next questions and Subir yes, to be short in the answers. And we can take some things into the canteen and, We'll have some sweet around it, so um, to lighten the matter. So now, um, uh, TP, I'll give the mic to TP simply because he's already from TIFR. So uh, TP, um, a short question, and then we can. Yes. Uh, so a very nice talk. So um, uh, the abundance of light elements as calculated in BBN is consistent with what is observed in the universe today. Would this consistency be disturbed? in a detectable way if you drop the FRW assumption? I'm sorry, could you repeat that? It, 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 it was, was a, suppose the early universe is not homogeneous and isotropic. Oh, I see. Okay, I got your question. The early universe. Now, this, uh, uh, the uh, uh, okay, in principle, what we are seeing could be due to a relic of the early universe. It could be due to a super scale perturbation, okay, which can affect, for example, uh, CMB, but not the matter. We have, in fact, studied that question with uh, Subodh Pati, uh, and Graham uh, Dominic. We actually looked at that. When he found, in principle, a superhorizon isocurvature perturbation can generate a difference between the two dipoles, but it has to be fine-tuned. When you looked at it, because this had been proposed by Jim Gunn many years ago as a possible uh, reason why the CMB dipole may not be the same as the matter dipole, but it requires alignment of the two to a degree which we find rather fine-tuned, but you have quantified it. So uh, I'll uh, send you a link to that paper if you want to study that issue. So I was asking, <laughs> how will BBN be affected? Pardon? Big Bang nucleosynthesis? No, no, no. This is, uh, they, it won't affect the radiation dominated data. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Sorry, I have to cut this short. Um, Shadab, if you have the last question, yeah. maybe just a short, and then we can take it that short. Sure, very quick. Thanks a lot, Subir. Uh, I was just wondering if we can uh, comment on possible ideas in terms of within the Lambda CDM framework, and then on top of that, what could explain this uh, twice the amplitude in terms of the dipole anisotropy? Yeah. For example, there is one paper proposed by Darling and Bonvine, which uh, talked about the evolution of the sources in terms of the causal sample. Right, right. And if so you have some 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah, something reasonable, even right. something which you can be measured with EBOS, sure. sure. we'll be able to explain this. Uh, I, I don't know if you can comment about some simple yes, things. Yes, but, uh, the spectrum of uh, evolution, the correlated. So those alpha and X parameters, we took to be uncorrelated. So what we are asking is, supposing they're correlated, so the expectation of alpha times x is not the same as alpha and x, right? Actually, uh, Charles Zalan, who uh, did get in touch with us about that, was not aware of how we had actually tested the hypothesis using Monte Carlo simulations of mock skies, which take all such possible correlations into account, statistically anyway, right? But apart from that, a subsequent analysis of our catalog, which has just come out from an independent group in Australia, they use a Bayesian approach, right? And they try to account for evolution in the way that Bon Bon Dalang proposed it could happen. And they show that it makes a 6% effect at most. Okay. So we can discuss in more detail later. This is a new preprint. 
essentially it says the worst that it can do is change our result by six percent. That's very different from what yes. Gunvin and Dalang is. Yes. Actually, to be fair, they never said in the paper that it could explain our answer. That was the interpretation of the result by other people who wanted to, of course, uh, would like to see the world safe for standard FLRW model. Okay. 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 Well, thank you, Subir. This you. was very, very nice. We had so much discussion from the colloquium. So let's thank Subir once again. A big round of applause. And I would like to thank the Zoom audience for joining in as well. Thank you. And a big shout out to Mr. G and everybody who put an effort to get the AV yes. done. Yes. Um, and so we had a large YouTube audience as well. So thank you. Thank you very much. We will move, move for some snacks and sweets. Very good. Outside the rest. Thank you. Sorry for uh, overrunning no, so no. bad.